and how worthy he is of our praise. You just stop and think about all that the Lord has done in your life. Uh, first of all, he saved you, and none of us were worthy of that or deserved that. But thank God he birthed us into his family and loved us and saved us. Just think how many blessings and how many times the Lord has blessed you uh, since you got saved. And he's good to us. Man, I'll tell you, the Lord is just so, so good to us. And we're thankful of that. All right, 1 John chapter 2. You can stand. We're in verse number 3. Just so happens, and, and I didn't realize it when we began our... And, Pretty much what I have done ever since I've been here, we've got into a, a thought. We've preached through some books. We've preached through the parables of the Lord. We're studying about the life of Christ right now on Wednesday nights and uh, just uh, going through books. And just so happened I've begun uh, just a few weeks ago into 1 John, and now we're into 1 John in our Sunday school uh, class, so in the adult class. So it just happened that they have run together, but that's okay. We can study on during the Sunday school time, and then we can still preach out of this during the preaching hour. It'll be just fine. I, I want to use this as a thought, and I think this is one of the things that John is wanting us to see here in chapter number two in the last few verses in verse three down through the end of the chapter in verse 29. And I, use, I, I want to use this thought by the way of a question. What should be our attitude toward? What should be our attitude to, towards some things? And John mentions a few of those in the Bible, and, and we can look at them and, and say, what, now what ought to be my attitude toward, toward these things? And in verse 3, he says, And hereby we do know that we uh, know him, that we know him. There are people that you know in life, and I'm glad that when there was a day that we come to know uh, the Lord, our Lord and Savior, as our blessed Savior, so we know him. Hereby we do know that we know him if we keep his commandments. He that saith, I know him, and keepeth not his commandments, is a liar, and the truth's not in him. But whoso keepeth his word in him, verily is the love of God perfected. Hereby know we that we are in him. He that saith, he abideth in him, on himself also to, uh, so to walk, even as he walked. Brethren, I write no new commandment unto you, but an old commandment which ye have heard had from the beginning. The old commandment is the word which ye have heard from the beginning. Again, a new commandment I write unto you, which thing is true in him and in you, because the darkness is past and the true light now shine. He that saith he is in the light and hateth his brother is in darkness even until now. He that loveth his brother abideth in the light, and there is none occasion of stumbling in him. But he that hateth his brother is in darkness, and walketh in darkness, and knoweth not whither he goeth, because that darkness hath blinded his eyes. I write unto you, little children, because your sins are forgiven you for his name's sake. And you say amen right there. Amen. I write unto you, fathers, because ye have known him that is from the beginning, I write unto you, young men, because ye have overcome the wicked one. I write unto you, little children, because ye have known the Father. I have written unto you, fathers, because ye have known him that is from the beginning. I have written unto you, young men, because ye are strong, and the word of God abideth in you, and ye have overcome the wicked one. Love not the world, neither the things that are in the world. If any man love the world, the love of the Father is not in him. And what he mentions in verse 16 is the three things that happened to Adam in the Garden of Eden. And you listen as he mentions these. For all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life is not of the Father, but is of the world. And the world passeth away, and the lust thereof, but he that doth the will of, the, of God abideth forever. Little children, it is the last time, and you've heard that Antichrist shall come. Even now are there many Antichrists, whereby we know that it is the last time. They went out from us, but they were not of us. For if they had been of us, they would no doubt have continued with us, but they went out that they might be made manifest that they were not all of us. But you have an unction from the Holy One, and you know all things. I have not written to you because you know not the truth, but because you know it. 
and that no lie is of the truth. Who is a liar, but he that denieth that Jesus is the Christ, he's Antichrist, that denieth the Father and the Son. Whosoever denieth the Son, the same hath not the Father, but he that acknowledgeth the Son hath the Father also. Let that therefore abide in you which ye have heard from the beginning. And that which ye have heard from the beginning shall remain in you, ye also shall continue in the Son and in the Father. And this is the promise that he hath promised us, even eternal life. These things have been written unto you concerning them that seduce you, <clears throat> but the anointing which ye have received of him <clears throat> abideth in him, and ye need not that any man teach you, but as the same anointing teacheth you of all things, and is truth, and is no lie, and even as it hath taught you, ye shall abide in him. And now, little children, abide in him, that when he shall appear, we may have confidence and not be ashamed before him at his coming. If you know that he is righteous, you know that everyone that doeth righteousness is born of him. Father, we're thankful for this hour that you've allowed us to come into. And I pray, Lord, that you clear our throats this morning, help us to be able to stand and preach the word of God. I pray, Lord, for each listener that, Lord, their hearts might be open and receptive to the preaching of the Word of God. And I pray for in a few minutes when we leave out of this church house, we can all leave saying that it's truly been good to be in the house of the Lord. Now, Lord, we've come to hear from heaven today and this congregation's come to be fed. And, if, Lord, if they're, if they're to be fed, then it'll be because that you came on the scene and you spoke through your servant. So I ask, Lord, that you'd anoint us afresh from on high. Speak through us the words that are needful for this hour. Get glory and honor out of this service. And, Lord, touch each heart. Right now we do pray in Jesus' name and all of God's people say it. Amen. Amen. You be seen. Four things that I want us to look at in this passage of Scripture this morning. And it is a tremendous passage that tells us what our attitude should be towards certain things in life. First, he talks about the commandments of God in verses 3 through 8. And what should be our attitude toward the commandments that God has given us. Then in verses 9 through 11, he tells us what our attitude should be toward the brethren, toward one another of the faith and those that are servants of God. Then in verses 15 through 17, he talks about what should be our attitude toward this world that we live in today. And the last few verses of the chapter, he tells us or talks to us about what our attitude should be toward the Antichrist, plural, not just the singular Antichrist, but the many Antichrists that are in this world and are even in this world that we live in today. First of all, he talks about our attitude toward the commandments of God. We're not going to go back and read these verses again because this is like right lengthy chapter and we're not going to read through it again. But in verses 3 through 5, he talks about what our attitude ought to be toward the commandments of God. Then not only that, but in the commandments of God, he talks about our relationship or our acquaintance and how we know God personally in our lives. I thought about how that there are degrees of acquaintance. And you think about this, and we're going to talk a little bit about it on a, a natural level, how we come to know one another, and then we're going to drop the spiritual uh, side into it as well on how we came to know the Lord. There's the introduction uh, period. There was a day... When you and your dearest friend, whoever that might be, were strangers. Amen? You didn't know one another. Uh, you were strangers to one another. There was a day when uh, you and the person that's now your spouse were strangers. But somebody introduced you to each other. And Deb and I could go back and I could, I could relate to that uh, point that one introduced Deb and I to one another. And I'm thankful for that, still thankful today. After 44 years that uh, the Lord blessed someone to introduce us to one another. And I'm thankful of that. 
Some believe in love in first sight, but at, at, at first sight, and, and I guess that happens sometimes, but I believe uh, relationships develop over a period of time, and lots of times those develop slowly. Let me ask you this, fellas. Do you love your wife now more than you uh, did when you first got married? I would recommend you to say yes right there. <laughs> if your answer is that you love her more right now, it's because you have nurtured that relationship. Over the time that you have been married, you've worked at it. And by the way, you've got to work at a marriage. you got to work at it to keep it going. And uh, if you answer that you're, uh, you love your wife more when you got married than you do right now, then it's because you've not nurtured that relationship. In fact, that marriage is probably stagnant or it might very well be on, you might very well be on the verge of terminating that marriage. And I don't want to see that happen, but you got to work at it and work at a marriage and work at your relationship and work at growing together while one with another. Then the, when we put the spiritual side on it, there was a day when you and Jesus were total strangers. You didn't know the Lord. You didn't have any, you know, before I got saved, I, had, I, I could have cared less about the church and the things. I'll just be honest with you. And most of you were right there. You had no thought, you had no inclination about you to want to be around the Lord, around the church, around people of God. But thank God we got introduced to Jesus Christ. Amen. Let me ask you this. Do you love Jesus more now? Or did you love him more then? I love him because he loved me enough to save me. Amen. And I'm here to tell you, I loved him deeply. The moment I bowed around an old-fashioned altar and I confessed my sins to God and he in love reached down and cleansed me and saved me and forgave me of my sins, I love him for that. Amen. Folks, I want to tell you, I love him even more today than I did then. Because God's been good to me. He's blessed me down through the You say, preacher, you've had some bumps in the road. Haven't we all? Yeah. Haven't we all had some bumps in the road? Yeah. Have there been times that we'd uh, sure wish that had been a little bit better? There have been times when our health got down. We wish that our health would have been a little bit better. But through it all, through the thick and through the thin, thank God, God's been good to us. Amen. Yeah. And the good part is, one day he's going to come in the clouds of glory. Yeah. And he's going to get us and he's going to take us from this old world and take us to a better place. Amen. And I'm thankful of that. Yeah. But I love him more today. And it's because that I have nurtured that relationship. And if you've not nurtured that relationship and you don't love him more today, then that relationship's going to grow stagnant. You, just like you got to work in a marriage, you got to work a little at this. You got to talk to him. I mean, hey, I, I enjoyed the privilege of prayer. I enjoyed the time that I can sit down and open the pages of this blessed book and let God begin to speak to my heart. That's how you grow in the Lord. And you keep that thing. Keep that fire burning and have a good relationship with the Lord. You know, there's a lot of people that have not kept that fire burning, have not kept that acquaintance in such a, a, a point that they love God more and more as the days go by. There's a lot of people that have just considered quitting uh, Christianity and quitting being a Christian and quit walking with the Lord. Let me encourage you this morning. Don't quit. Man, I think a lot of time. Hadn't the devil come to every one of us. At some point in our life. Especially when things were going a little rough. And we'd just gone through a great. Maybe 
trial and some difficult times. And here comes the old devil and he whispers in our ear, why go on? Why continue? Why not just throw in the trail, run up the white flag of surrender and say I've had enough? But I'm reminded of this. I've come too far to look back now. Hey, I don't even have anything to look back to. I, I thank God that I burn a lot of bridges that I come across and I have no desire to go back to them and the life that I lived before I came to know Jesus Christ I couldn't go back to that and be happy now because I've tasted of the good things of God. Amen. And I've tasted of the heavenly manna so there's nothing to look back to. And so every time the devil comes and he whispers in the ear and says, why not just give up? You be reminded, hey, there's nothing to look back to and you've come too far to ever look back now anyway. Hey, I'm nearing the shore. <laughs> see the lights of glory. I'm too near home to ever think about turning around and looking back now. Amen. So just keep on keeping on for the Lord. Amen. Amen. After the introduction stage comes the growing and the maturing of that acquaintance. Some acquaintances never mature past that introduction stage. You know that person, but rarely do you know that person beyond a recognition stage. Isn't that true? Some acquaintances grow and they deepen with the passing years. You not only know that person as in name recognition, but you know them. I mean, you really know them. See the difference thus far in just the introduction stage and the really getting to know them. Then there's the intimacy stage. It's almost like a pyramid. With the, with, with the knowledge or the introduction at the bottom and the progression is upward, it's going up and up. Very few people at the top of that pyramid. Now think about it. There are few, very few people that you really, really know. Am I right? Very few people that you really, really know. Perhaps it's your best friend, perhaps it's your spouse, and I thought this when I was studying in this message. My wife knows all about me. She knows all my faults and all my shortcomings. And every little thing that might just annoy you, she knows all about them. And some of them I'm sure I annoy her with. But yet she loves me. Through all that. Aren't you glad? Listen. There's some things about you that annoys God, I'm sure. But aren't you glad he still loves you? Amen. In spite of it all, in spite of all those tendencies that, that you have that probably just irritates God, God still loves you. Amen. And I'm thankful of that. Jesus desires to be at the top of the pyramid in your relationship. When you say, I know him, I know Jesus, let me ask you this. At what degree of acquaintance is that knowledge? Do you simply know him because somebody introduced you to him? Or do you know him because you have an ever-increasing knowledge of him? Or is yours an intimate acquaintance? I want an intimate acquaintance with the Lord, don't you? I mean, where I really know that I know that I know him personally in my life. We're admonished also in this passage to keep the commandments. Now let me take, say this. We are not saved by keeping commandments. But keeping the commandments of God and the word of God is proof of our conversion. When we do what God said for us to do, it proves to this world that we've come to know him personally in our life. Folks say, well, you know about faith and, and works. Paul spoke about faith. Man will save by grace through faith. And that not of ourselves is a gift, is a gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. James showed, said, show me your faith without your works, and I'll show you my faith by my works. And so said, Paul preached about faith, and, and James preached about works. And James, it's all by faith, folks. 
folks. It's all by faith. But listen, God can see my faith. Can you? You cannot see my faith. God knows what faith I have. But listen, can you see my works? That's what James is talking about. Paul said, we're saved by grace through faith. God already knows the faith that we have placed in him and what our faith is. You don't see my faith. God does. The only thing that you can see is my works. So by my works that I display, and I'm not working my way to heaven, I could never do that. But you are seeing what I am and that the, the, the profession of my faith is genuine because it has an outward sign to it. It's works. And so uh, hey, I'm glad I'm saved by grace through faith too, aren't you? Mm -hmm. Serenthius and his followers when John was writing this were preaching a contrary doctrine saying that Christians ought not oppose him because of love. You hear a lot of that today. I bet if you're a loving Christian, you won't oppose what I'm doing. You just, through love, we're supposed to just embrace everything, embrace one another, and love one another. But let me ask you this. Should we allow error to come about in the name of love? I'm not, I'm here to tell you, I'm not going to just embrace everything coming down the pipe. People say we ought to uh, embrace homosexuality today. You ought to, through love, just embrace them because this love that you and I are to have for people, and I've said this and I'll say it again and again, I preach against that lifestyle because it's condemned in the Word of God. Amen. But I do not hate the sinner, I hate the sin. Amen. And there is a difference. Amen. Love the sinner but hate the sin. You can't show me one instance now. Are you listening to me right here? If you can, you come show me after church and I'll get in this pulpit and I'll say I was wrong. But you cannot, I don't believe, show me one instance in the Bible where Jesus embraced a sinner and he sinned. He embraced the sinner, but he never embraced the sin. He rejected the sin. The commandments that are listed in verses 3 uh, through 4 do not refer to the Ten Commandments or the moral law and certainly not to the ceremonial law or to any set of, of standards. It refers to God's Word, the commandments given in God's Word, which includes all the statements made concerning any subject. Ten Commandments we need to follow. Are the commandments, though, throughout the Word of God, if they are a command given to you, we're to obey the commandments given to you and I as God's people, whatever that they might be. People will say today, preacher, I know the Lord. I'm going to heaven. And some will even go on and they'll say, I don't believe that Jesus is the son of God, but I believe in God and I know I'm all right. This passage states very emphatically, now listen to this, that you're a liar. You don't know the Lord. If you deny Jesus Christ, you cannot know God the Father. Because the only way to come into a right relationship with God the Father is through and by His Son, Jesus Christ. Can I say it one more time? He's not a good way. He's the only way. Secondly, what ought to be my attitude toward the breath? Verses 9 through 11. John said in John 15, 17, These things I command you, that ye love one another. John 13, 35, By this shall all men know that you are my disciples, if you have love one to another. A person cannot have true religion unless he has a love for the breath. Do you love one another? There are times, now listen to me, stay with me right here. There are times I have to pray, God help me love so and so. Help 
Because some way some people act sometimes and the way some people will do you personally or what they may do to you personally, sometimes it may become a little difficult to love that brethren or that brother or that sister. But if we got the love of God in us, we'll love even though when they hurt us. And I, will, I want to take you back to an occasion a little over 2,000 years ago. There was a man just outside of Jerusalem. They took him and they nailed him on a cross. But from that cross, he looked down at that angry mob that had mocked him and laughed at him and spat in his face, placed a crown of, 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 of thorns down upon his head, who nailed him to that cross, and yet from that cross he could look down and say, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. Friend, that's love. And if God loved you and I to that degree, can't you and I love one another? Uh, in verse 10, he says, there's none occasion of stumbling in him. That can be somewhat misleading. A person can stumble and keep his feet. Man, I've done that a lot of times. Deb don't do it too often. She stumbles and falls a lot. But I can stumble and keep my feet. She went to the doctor the other day, and the doctor asked her, said, have you fallen any lately? She said, yes, in fact, I have. And said, my husband says I can fall standing flat-footed on level ground. And the doctor says, in other words, you can't walk and chew bubble gum at the same time. And she said, that's pretty much the way it is. But you can stumble without falling. You ever stumble not falling? You come real close. The word here is scandalon. That, that Greek word is scandalon. It denotes a person that has gotten hopelessly into a trap. He's not only stumbled, but he's fallen. A scandal on is like a stick that triggers a trap. Any of you ever trap rabbits when you was little? <clears throat> Went out and set a box trap, and you'd build that box trap, and you'd build that thing, and, and, and you'd put a, a stick across the top and with a string on it, and that string would be attached to another stick, and that stick would be down inside that rabbit box. And when that rabbit went in and hit that stick, it dropped the door down. That's the trap that he's talking about right here in that passage of Scripture. It refers to that which causes a person to fall or to become entrapped. That's what happens when we profess to be saved and hate the brother. We've been entrapped by a lie. If you love God and you've been saved, you'll love one another. You know how I can love one another? I don't say again that it comes easy sometimes to love certain people. But I can love others because I realize this. While I see their faults, I realize I got a lot of mine. And I can love them in spite of their faults and I hope and pray they can love me in spite of mine. So why can't we just love one another? Matthew speaks of it this way when Jesus spoke in Matthew 18, 6. But whoso shall offend one of these little ones which believe in me, it were better for him that a millstone were hanged about his neck and that he were drowned in the depths of the sea. The passage says that we're to love the bread. It sounds like a command to me, don't it, Jim? Sounds like we're commanded to love one another. <laughs> then thirdly, what ought to be my attitude toward this world? Verses 15 through 17. Three things in this brief little passage right here. We're not to love the world. We are not to love the world. James chapter 4 and verse 4, you don't have to turn back over just a page or two if you want to look at it. But James 4, 4 says, You adulterers and adulteresses, know ye not that the friendship of the world is enmity with God? Whosoever therefore will be a friend of the world is the enemy of God. And in Colossians chapter number 3 and verse number 2, Paul wrote and he said this in Colossians chapter number 3 and verse number 2, Set your affection on things above and not on things of this earth. 
There's an old song that says this, This world is not my home, I'm just a passion through. My treasures are laid up somewhere beyond the blue. Ooh, I'm glad this ain't home. Now I know we have a desire to live here and to stay here just as long as we can. But listen folks, I'm glad I ain't home. I'm going to a place where sin is going to be forever abolished. I'm going to a place where sickness will not be known of again. I'm going to a place where there be no heartache, no sadness, no disappointments. And I'm going to a place where we'll never, ever die. And brother, that's better than anything this world has to offer. So this world is not my own. I'm just a passing through. It's, but it's simply not the case with a lot of Christians. We have no treasures in heaven when we've accumulated them all right here. I read an in interesting little story uh, several years ago, but I read it again this past week, and I think it fits this message right well. The story says that there was a wild duck that was on migration, and he'd come down into a barnyard where tame dirts, ducks were feeding. He liked the food so well that he stayed a day and then a week and then a month and then the whole season he stayed right there in the barnyard with the tame ducks. One day he heard a familiar honking high overhead and he recognized that it was the call of his former companions winging their way home. His eyes sparkled, his heart beat faster and he rose to join them. But alas, he had fed too well and could get no higher than the eaves of the barn. Story goes on that he said to himself, oh well, what difference does it make anyway? I like it here. So he spent the rest of his life in a barnyard. Then the day came when his old companions passed over and he never even heard them call. Now that's just a story and it's a humorous little story. But we've seen men and women who once mounted up with wings of eagles but are now content to live in the barnyard of this old world. I have to live in this world, but I don't have to be a part of this world. Not only we're not to love the world, we're not to love the things that are in this world. Now there's nothing wrong with possessing things, but we're not to love those things. What do you love most? The things of this world or the things of God? It's very hard for me to rationalize the accumulation of wealth that a lot of the TV evangelists possess today. And you say, why is that preacher? Because when those are compared to the Bible characters that I find in the Bible, it just doesn't match up. Most of the Bible characters in the Bible lived in poverty. They didn't have it real well. We've got so affixed to this old world, my goodness, God help us. Then we note the steps and temptation. You know where Satan begins on us at? Boy, does he do a work on my mind sometimes. There's been times that I've had to just stop and say, like Jesus did to Peter one day, and God, Jesus knew who was causing Peter to bring about what was going to say, get behind me, Satan. Just get out of the way. I have to stop and say, Lord, help my mind. My goodness, I'm thinking the wrong things and thinking the wrong thoughts. But the Lord begins with the mind. He plants a desire in that mind, whether through the flesh or through selfishness or through pride. But he gets us to think in the wrong thing. Then he moves from the mind to the heart. Proverbs 4.23 says, God, Guard thy heart with all diligence, for out of it are the issues of life. Or you better guard against what goes in here and what is in here. If that seed that's planted in the mind is allowed to begin to germinate, the heart will start loving what Satan has put in your mind. You start loving it with your heart. Then Satan will move into action. You'll do what you first only thought about doing. 
first thing you know, you're right in the middle of it. The, re the person who commits adultery, already thought about it. The person that steals, already thought about it. And then they act upon it. And then let's look at the last thing and we're going. What should be my attitude toward Antichrist? Now that's a long passage right there. The word Antichrist here would apply to anyone who is who's in opposition to Christ. We know the Antichrist is going to step on the scene one day, but there are a lot of Antichrist already in this world. They were in John's day and they're here today. One mark of the Antichrist is the fact that they will originate in the church. Look at it. Verse 19, where did they originate? In the church. They went out from us. They were in the church. In 2 Thessalonians 2, 4, Paul makes it clear regarding the great Antichrist who is going to sit in the very temple of God. He's going to make people believe he is God. And there's going to be a lot of people that will fall down and worship him. And there's a lot of Antichrist out there today. However hostile to Christ and Christianity, that paganism or Judaism or Mohammedism or, or, and, and of the political powers around this world, and then all those movements may be, now listen to me, None of these are Antichrist. Because Paul John said they went out from us. It indicates that these Antichrists were once a part of the church. The most damaging person to the local church today in our world is that person that was once a real part of the fellowship and they quit that fellowship and they now stand against the church and that same group which they once identified with and now they condemn that group that they identified with. And that's a problem in the church. There's a group today known as Fundamentalist Anonymous. You know where most of those came from? Right out of Baptist and Pentecostal churches. They got tired of the strict, rigid set of standards. Now they join hands against, against the fundamentalists like you and I. And John said, these are Antichrist. They went out from us. I believe there's an attempt to seduce them earlier. He mentioned John did that they were still saved. So this, I feel like he's given us as a warning to aware of men and women who attempt to seduce you from the truth. Man, there is a bunch of them on the airways today. They sound good. Man, I'm telling you, they got a tongue that if you could call it a golden tongue, they got one. And I've listened to some of them and I thought to myself, man, how easy it'd be to be sucked in by that. As long as they just seem like they reach out there and they've got a hold of you and just pull you. But listen, Satan's very deceptive today. And he'll, he'll appeal to people in any way that he can through enticing words, through seduction, through whatever means that he might be able to work through get people away from God. You say, preacher, he'll never get me. He'll never get, don't brag on that. Peter said, Lord, though all should turn again, I'll be here when the going gets tough, Lord, I'll be right here by your side. Three times before the cock crew, Peter denied that he even knew the Lord. So listen, you know what the Bible said? When you think you stand, Beware lest you fall. You know who, the Satan, who Satan's out to get? Amen. Yeah, you. Yeah, you. Yeah, and you too. And you. He's out to get us all. I need to pray every day, God help me. That I'll fall into the clutches and the woo of the old devil. God help us. God help us. What's your
What's your attitude toward the commandments of God? What's your attitude towards the brethren? Hey, what's your attitude towards uh, uh, the world and the things of this? Hey, what's your attitude toward the Antichrist? I want to be in opposition to him, don't you? What's your attitude? God help us this morning that our attitude might be a good one. That's rock solid in the Lord. Amen. Let's stand with our heads bowed and our eyes closed. <coughs> Father, I don't know where to go in direction and way of an altar call this morning, so it just be a general one. To unsaved that they might come to know Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. In your family, the body of believers, Lord, that we might have been just touched somehow in some way by the word of God this morning. If we see a need to come and bow around this altar, maybe just to come and say, Lord, I know the devil's real. I know I'm saved. I know I'm born again on my way to heaven. But God, please help me. Please help me that I'll see. And I'll hear the voice when the devil talk, starts calling out to me. And I'll not respond to it. But I'll turn and submit my life wholeheartedly unto you. May this need to come and say, God, I need you help. Need you help in the midst of the trials of life. So, Lord, whatever the need might be, help folks just to step out and come this morning. We'll thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Whatever your need may be, you respond as the Lord spoke to your heart this morning. If you're not a Christian, hey, it'd be a good day for you to get saved. Come to know Him. As your personal savior, while we sing, will you come? so it's not important that I know all the needs and the situations. But Lord, not only do you know the need, but you're able to meet the need. And I pray for these that have come today, Lord, that you just touch and help in whatever situation that is, whatever they may be just coming and asking God for your strength and help in the midst of, I pray that you'll meet that need today. That's all you're able to do. Thank you for the time that you've allowed us to spend together this morning. Thank you for the fellowship that we've enjoyed here in the house of God today. And as we leave, may you, Lord, give us a good afternoon, a day of rest. It's not only a day of worship, but it's a day of rest. And may we, Lord, for a little while this afternoon be able to go rest these old tired bodies. And then, Lord, be able to come back tonight for the evening service. And, Lord, until then... I pray, Lord, that you just rest us and give us a good day in your name and bless in our service tonight. We'll thank you and praise you in Jesus' name and amen. And amen. Well, don't forget, uh, tonight, 6 o'clock, will be our evening service. Come back. We're going to talk about faith and feelings tonight. Boy, I tell you, aren't you glad you aren't saved with your feelings? <laughs> First of all, if we're saved by our feelings, I'd get up some mornings and I'd feel like I wouldn't say. It's not my feeling, it's my faith. Amen. We'll talk some and preach to you.